Because I will tell you now as a person who's been using growth hormone for three years and obviously gotten thousands of people around the world using low dose growth hormone now too, that the benefit is so amazing. So, because I had, I did a podcast recently with, you know, Ryan Smith and we were talking sure. about, uh, you know, doing growth hormone, but he was talking about there's a kind of an inverse benefit on um, the pace of aging. So it's kind of trying to find that happy medium where, because obviously there's a lot of health span benefits of doing it. So, but with like the minimal impact on your pace of aging. Uh, from a, from an epigenetic aging perspective, uh, because I think we tend to get different data as it relates to growth hormone um, and uh, where it, we see it tends to go in the wrong direction. Really? Okay, yeah, 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 okay. it, it certainly depends on the duration and the dose. Well, I mean, Ryan is young, right? I'm 52. Oh. How old are you? I'm going to be 37 soon. My eyes do look quite a bit older today and I've aggravated them with too many skin serums. So be careful, guys. Okay, you guys are young guys, man. Like, Ryan's interpretation of the data is not what always comes out. And I love Ryan and we're close friends, but it's not always reality in life. I mean, I'm almost 53 and I have very, very low biological age. And I would tell you that as long as you use a surgically precise dose of growth hormone um, and obviously mitigate all the other factors, which are really important, which is obviously suppressing blood, blood glucose. Mm -hmm. uh, living as I call insulin controlled, you know, the mTOR signaling stuff that he's talking about causing an issue with like longevity and telomere stuff. I, I don't know if it's really true. I mean, because again, there's always the debate of like quality versus quantity. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will shorten my lifespan by 10 years, you know, but will I still live really robustly in that time mm -hmm. that I am alive? So I think it's a qualitative versus a quantitative assessment. Sure, right. Yeah. Because I will tell you now as a person who's been using growth hormone for three years and obviously gotten thousands of people around the world using low dose growth hormone now too, that the benefit is so amazing. Um, you know, when, when, when combined with all the other things that I don't really know. I mean, obviously I, I need to go another 20 to 30 years, hopefully being able <laughs> to use it to see, but you know, when we start looking at the research and we see like, okay, well, there's an inverse benefit or slash relationship with IGF one and mTOR and all of those things. Um, with growth hormone, I don't know, you know, the other thing is, is like, we also have to start realizing that our environments are so contaminated. Back on to the growth hormone, because some, you know, Rhonda Patrick, she calls it like a, a double-edged sword. So like raising it, uh, you know, compromising, you know, you're burning the candle a little bit faster. But then I think there's obviously, there's a healthy range to be in. And uh, from what I've gathered, you know, for a younger person, the negatives of being low and IGF one, there, there's a lot. There's more health benefits from what I've gathered. It's yeah, if you're old and you, you know, put it up too much, then that there's there's increases of certain risks. But when, when you're younger, you know, you want to make try and keep it in that healthy range. But then that's the argument. What what is that healthy range? Well, so I mean, look, I, I always say the difference between a pill and a poison is the dosage. And the reality is, is like, you're asking, what is a healthy range? I don't think anyone knows what the healthy range is. I mean, I, I, ultimately at the end of the day, if we go like as deep as we possibly can here and we get really meta, we're not even real, right? We are, we are in these physical avatar bodies, but we're basically energy, you know, spiritual energy, soul, whatever you want to call it. There's a million different names for it, depending on your culture. And so it's like, if you minimize your resistance which is ultimately physical it, a physical resistance is inflammation um you know you can use all of these different agents whether they're peptide agonist growth hormone agonists like tessamorelin ipamorelin ctc or you actually use human growth hormone itself directly in surgically precise dosages to enhance cellular life to enhance your power or your performance or strength your fat loss your muscle gain you know all of these different things um, but like you said, it's like, what is, you know, the difference between when it causes harm versus when it doesn't. Now, obviously most people, when they think of, they hear the term growth hormone, they think of bodybuilders right? right. Uh, and, 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 you know, and people that are, you know, physiological mutants who have obviously amazing genetics who can look like that, you know, and then take ample amounts of what I call polypharmacy between anabolic steroids and human growth hormone and insulin and God knows what else is out there. Hmm. Um, Versus like what we're doing and what we're recommending for anti-aging or living longer, stronger purposes, which is again, a very surgically precise dose. So in the research that I've read 
And there really isn't a lot in healthy aging adults. There is a lot of research in children with dwarfism and they give those kids massive dosages of growth hormone. It really aren't a lot of negative side effects other than, um, you know, some of them do get uh, acromology, which is obviously, you know, forehead bone enlargement or whatever. Cause again, they're Mm -hmm. in their formulative years and their body, their growth plates, their physios uh, plates have not closed yet. So they do get that. But other than that, there really aren't a lot of side effects. So if you look at then what we're recommending or what I'm recommending or people like me are recommending, it's like, you know, one to one and a half to two IUs. And, you know, for women, some, some less than one I use say for five days a week, Monday through Friday, taking Saturday and Sunday off. Uh, and again, I, I don't really recommend this for anybody who's under the age of 40. I mean, I, there's plenty of people that I do know in their thirties that are using growth hormone. Um, but again, you know, get your IGF one levels matched or measured naturally. Now, one of the problems, Tony, of getting your IGF one levels measured is, you know, it's, it's a very difficult lab measurement value. You can measure it three times in a day and have very, a variant right. score all the time. Right. So that's not even the most accurate gauge. So it's like, you know, Anthony J will say like, well, you know, you can get your um, DNA analyzed too. And, you know, the higher, the higher uh, Neanderthalus you have, the more IGF, the more circulating IGF one you have naturally too, which is kind of funny because I have like close to six percent uh, Neanderthal in my my DNA. People right. are like, they ask me like, what does that mean? It means like if I hit you, bro, I'm gonna cave in your skull. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean it's like it's funny because like my younger brother was a brawler growing up, and like he was a real long lean angly guy but if he hit you man you would you would pretty much go Not down and it, then, yeah. yeah when i figured that out like 25 years later i was like oh no i understand you know it's a bone it's the bone structure the bone density it's heavier bone but um but back to your question like it's tough to understand or call um again what is the benefit of the intention of using um you know one to one and a half to two i use of growth hormone and most of the people adults that i work with and stuff uh, you know, in their fifties, sixties and older, um, they only report amazing things right now. The question, you know, with Rhonda Patrick or anybody who really researches this and looks deeper into this is like, at what level of that dosage is the possibility of, you know, increasing metastatic tumor formation or accelerating the, you know, potential of, you know, especially if you have like a predisposition in your family line or DNA of having cancer of a certain, you know, um, uh, organ system, you know, what is, what is the possible acceleration through the, again, mTOR alteration and the IGF one increases of enhancing the formation of those, you know, potential cancers or tumors or whatever. And it's like, there's not a lot of data. I just did a really awesome podcast three weeks ago with two or three doctors that I regularly work with. I have a show on Wednesday nights called the uh, health optimization round table. And it's like three, three of the top uh, physicians, health optimization doctors in the West for sure. And we were all debating this. And that was the, you know, the question does growth hormone in a surgically precise dose accelerate or improve the rate of cancer. And to a man, all three of the doctors said it does not. Um, however, again, everything is lifestyle related. Could it? So, yeah, yes. yeah. So, so if you're in your body was unhealthy inflamed, then yeah, then absolutely. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, I think th- exactly. And, and I think that we could make that argument for everything that almost everything that we do is exacerbated or accelerated or lowered relative to our lifestyle. Right. So if we're a healthy person, otherwise healthy person who's not smoking, we're not drinking. Um, we don't consume too much sugar. We have low levels of body fat. And look, the number of that is that's a very simple number. You can just look at the research, but a healthy level of body fat for a male to maintain year round is between 12 and 16%. And a woman is between 16 and 22%. When you start going above those levels as a male or a female, that's when you start getting uh, higher levels of visceral body fat. And as you know, visceral body fat tends to hang out around the organs mm. And, you know, once you start having visceral body fat around the organs with that kind of level of inflammation, you're going to cause disease and dysregulation because, again, um, visceral body fat is the most uh, inflammatory substance that we know of. It's more inflammatory than kerosene. So think about how weird that is, that like the body is designed to house visceral body fat. And the more visceral body fat that you have, the more inflamed you are in that area where you house the visceral body fat. And if it's around the organs, 
all those cytokine storms that are ongoing, right. you know, regularly are going to eventually lead to some sort of dysregulation of the, you know, metabolic pathways or the heart, or, you know, you're going to get uh, some form of cancer. So it's interesting how that all works out. So again, if you just maintain a level of body fat as a man under 15% and as a woman under 20, and obviously you exercise, you get enough sleep, you know, you avoid EMFs. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, you know, you don't sleep with your cell phone plugged in next to your head. Uh, and you, you know, obviously have, there's a, there's a, you know, a mindset um, component to this, you know, you're hopefully doing some form of inner work and attaining stillness, whether, you know, whether you meditate or go out into nature or whatever like that, you know, you're probably going to mitigate a lot of the issues that were still faced, even in these, you know, contaminated quote unquote, I won't call them war zones yet, but, but <laughs> contamination zones in the, in the large cities around the world. Yeah. I mean, that get, kind of gets me onto you talking about visceral fat in that, you know, you think like if you've got decades worth of visceral fat and you're going to keep that there, then doing like an eight week cycle of tessamoralin or something to break that down, you think, how can that surely be, you know, compared to like, you think having that fat there for another few more decades rather than just breaking it down and, you know, in the space of eight weeks, you think surely. Dude, that, to, to... That's a great point. You know, I have these conversations with people all the time, every day, you know, it's like they, they are so excited about peptides and growth hormone releasing agents and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, but what about your hormones? Are your hormones optimized? And they just kind of look at me with like a blank stare. And it's like, do you even know if you have a testosterone deficiency or hormone deficiency? And it's like, no, why would I need to? What does that matter? You know? So it's like, there's so, it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning of this, like the interpretation of understanding like, what do I need to have in order to do these other things? And obviously people see peptides and now bioregulators um, and they think they're magic bullets. They think they can just start applying them, you know, to their day-to-day -day life when they don't have any of the, you know, quote unquote principles dialed in again of sleep, you know, exercise, uh, controlling for inflammation, living insulin control, all of those things. So if you don't have any of those things done and you're then wanting to use peptides, or growth hormone, or even, you know, steroids. I mean, it's not going to matter. You're, you're not going to get any kind of results. And that's where the biggest problem I think today is, is like attempting to teach people that there are some bases that have to be covered. You know, I, I like to call it, you know, full, fully, fully optimized. And it's like, if you don't have the pillars, you know, or the basics, you know, whatever you want to call it, the, like the three-legged stool, you know, dialed in of again, uh, proper sleep, proper exercise, combination of resistance training, bone bearing training, and of course, cardiovascular training. And then of course, living insulin controlled, no peptide or steroid, or, you know, even therapeutic testosterone is going to do very much for you because you don't have the basics, mm. you know, dialed in first. And that's the most important thing. You can't just take any of these things and think that they're going to start helping you until you actually look at getting your, 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 uh, the, ba the balance is set. Yeah, that gets me into like uh, John Francois Trent, um, John Francois Tremblay. You know him, of course. Can, I know can, him. Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, yeah. He was saying exactly that. That you know, like um, if you've got a high fasting blood glucose level, then pretty much all these peptides, the the benefits of them are going to be massively uh, less than you know if you were optimized, as you say. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And that's the biggest issue is like attempting to teach people that. And, and I've done a really good job of that. I, you know, I mean, I, sometimes I'm pretty harsh, you know, in my emails and stuff, but I tell people like, if you're a human dumpster fire, right. High inflammation, high belly fat, don't exercise, your diet sucks and your sleep habits are poor. You're going to get absolutely nothing from peptides. Yeah. You might be able to take a nootropic peptide and feel a little bit of a cognitive enhancement, but you're not going to get any of the other things that people rave about. Sure, if you tear your um, shoulder or your elbow or something like that, you can eject PPC or TB500 right into the area. Maybe you'll heal faster, but you're still not going to heal as fast as someone who is more healthy optimized. Mm -hmm.